So Paul, this is really neat stuff. But, so we found some things, but are we able to make any conclusions based on a statistical basis so we know how frequent these things are? Well, here's the data on what we've currently seen. Um, so the uh, red dots over here are the planets discovered um, and confirmed by the transit method. So we're plotting the mass here against separation, and of course the ones found by transit are all very close in. Yep. Um, it's not including most of the Kepler ones because they are not confirmed, but they'll be down around here. And we've seen the radial velocity, which finds some of these hot Jupiters, but is finding more and more of these eccentric giants up here. And the green dots over here, I hope you don't have red-green colour blindness like Brian does and can discriminate them. Um, they're about where you'd expect these things to be. So they're in this region over here, so about the Einstein radius out, a few astronomical units out. And you can see things down to quite low masses and also quite high mass ones. So you are indeed finding things where you'd expect. So we, so we, we know we have different selection effects here. Yeah. And so we think that the selection effects for the green points are pretty much just how far away they are. So the fact that they scatter down further down here mm -hmm. tells us that maybe the blue points are a little biased because, of course, the blue points don't find things down here. Yes, so we've already talked about how we go about working out biases, whether we do a Monte Carlo simulation or try and work out for each bin here what the odds are of seeing things. And so we can try and recreate what the true population is. And given we only have you know, seven or eight points here, it's pretty hard. Um, However, basically, about half of the high magnification events are followed up. They have yep. half of the bad weather, or they don't find them early enough, or something like this. And of those half that are followed up, um, about half show planets, really deviations. And the half that don't could still have them. They're just too small, or just having to fit in the gaps of the data, which wasn't very well sampled, or something. So it's looking like, of order, half of all these typically dwarf stars that we're in the foreground of our line of sight to the bulge have planets big enough to see out in this sort of range. Okay, so we can make some preliminary conclusions. We should compare it with the radial velocity. So remember, this is just a radial velocity plot now, and they are now getting to the stage where they can see Jupiter mass things out of Jupiter-like orbits. Right. And a recent paper by uh, Rob Wittenmeyer uh, concluded that they are seeing vaguely Jupiter-like things in about 3.3% of the stars they study. Right. However, that's almost certainly a gross underestimate of how many are out there because uh, they haven't got that many years of data. A lot of them you can't measure enough precision. So he estimated that uh, for everyone they see, they've missed at least a few, and maybe as many as 10, but it can't be much more than 10 they've missed. So, so they have to cr potentially could correct up their 3.3% by a factor of 10. It may be as much as 10, 12 or so, but it could well be less than that. It's okay. very uncertain, given they've only got like three of these things. But fortunately, we have microlensing, yeah. which doesn't have that selection bias. It's much better at doing it. We just don't have as many objects. So what do we get if we compare the two results? Well, let's compare this. And we find here the data from the radial velocity surface is mostly close in. So this is the number of these big planets as a function of distance. Here's a snow line. Yep. And the radial velocity is mostly telling you about the ones close in. And it's going up as we went out, as we said earlier. So it's very uncertain when you get out here. So we're extrapolating the data yep. when you've only got you know, a very small number of these things out here. And that's the microlensing data. A bit ahead, but probably consistent, given the large uncertainties in both of these things. OK, so they are consistent, although the microlensing saying maybe there's even more than suggested by the radial yep. velocities. So it looks like the number of planets really does keep on climbing as you get out here. But we're really looking at, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent. Mm -hmm. So 30, 40 percent seem to have Jupiter analogs. And it can't be much more than that because of the radial velocity data we've just been talking about. Yep. So if we try and work out the overall exoplanet population, this is very rubbery. We've got the classic hot Jupiters, the ones that were discovered first. And they're maybe you know, half a percent, one percent, depending quite where you draw the boundaries around so, them. So they really are an aberration. I yep. mean, They were seen first because they're easy, because they're yeah. so big and so close in. But they're not a large fraction. The eccentric giants are about 7%. But then we've got the close-in super-Earth seen by Kepler, which is maybe 30%. So those are very common, yeah. and we didn't know at all about them a few years ago. Yeah. And of course, these ones are often the same stars as this one. So for example, like Upsilon Andromeda has one of these and one of those. Okay. Yep. And now we're seeing that the Jupiter analogs are also maybe no more than 40%, probably at least 10 20%. So maybe 30% is a good guess we're getting. Number's very rubbery at the moment. Um, so yeah. But these objects, let's just be clear, can 
these objects occur in these solar systems as well, and we just wouldn't know about them simultaneously? It could be, because you bear in mind these are mostly being seen by Kepler, yep. whereas these are being seen mostly uh, by galactic bulge microlenses. They're not in the same stars. We can't look at the same stars and see both of these things. It'd be lovely if you could do microlensing in the Kepler field or point Kepler at the galactic bulge or something like that, but that's not happened. So it could be that these 30% are the same as these 30%, or it could be different. Maybe 30% here are 30% like that, and they don't overlap. Yeah, and the fact that microlensing only happens to one in a million stars means even if you looked at Kepler, the chances of getting lucky are almost zero. So, But maybe with future big telescopes, we could look for one of these events and then wait till the foreground dwarf stars drifted away from the background star and then try and nail it for radial velocity and see if you can work out okay. what else is so, there. So there is transit observations. So there are ways forward. But we are getting, I think, kind of an interesting picture here where solar systems seem to come in a variety of flavors, and it may well be that they're mixed, but certainly our own solar system does not appear to be grossly atypical. Though it's not dominant. Yes.